I and Mary Marshall Clark, who speaks here tonight with Ellen Conrad's. And I'd like to thank Terrell Frazier, the Director of Education and Outreach at the Center for Oral History for tonight's program, and our co-sponsors, the Human Rights Institute and the Center for Institutional and Social Change, both housed here at the law school. We're so grateful to Susan Sturm, the Director of the Center for Institutional and Social Change, and Greta Moseson at the law school for their generous and enthusiastic support of this series. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of what um, I think might be a first time conversation about world history and journalism and violence prevention between two New York Times alumna, award winning journalist, author, film producer, playwright Alex Kotlowitz, and oral historian, author, and the director of the uh, Columbia Center for Oral History, Mary Marshall Clark. There will be a Q&A following their conversation as the film excerpts will show. Um, to give you an idea of the scope of Mary Marshall's work and the, the center of Columbia Center for Oral History, um, the archive now holds nearly 20,000 hours of audio taped and videotaped interviews on national and international subjects. Shortly after the events of September 11, 2001, Clark and Peter Behrman undertook a longitudinal oral history project, the September 11, 2001 Oral History Narrative and Memory Project. More than 950 hours were collected with approximately 600 New Yorkers tracing both the event and the political afterlife of September 11, including the backlash against Muslim, Arab Americans, and others. Clark, Behrman, Catherine Ellis, and Stephen Drury Smith co-edited 19 of these stories, and after the fall, New Yorkers remember September 2001 and the years that followed. That was recently published by the New Press. Currently, Mary Marshall is directing a project on post-9-11 use of Guantanamo Bay um, uh, as a detention center, and on the ramifications of policies of torture and rendition on individuals and families. Um, Mary Marshall is the co-founder and director with P Peter Behrman of the nation's first master's program in oral history, launched here at Columbia in 2008. She is the past president of the Oral History Association and a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. Prior to her career at Columbia, as she collected, conducted oral history for the New York Times. And Alex Scott is the author of three books, including the national bestseller, There Are No Children Here. And many of us know this book. Um, the New York Public Library selected um, this as one of the 150 most important books of the 20th century. The book received the Helen Bernstein Award and Christopher Award, became a made-for-TV movie produced and starring Oprah Winfrey, and has impacted the lives of many of us here. Um, Alex's new film, The Interrupters, produced in collaboration with Steve James, premiered at Sundance last year and recently aired as a two-hour special on PBS's Frontline. It screened at the UN this past September and also here at the Miller Theater. Um, the Interrupters was cited as one of the best films of the year by The New Yorker, The Chicago Tribune, Entertainment Weekly, and The LA Times. So we're in for a treat. Um, it received the Independent Spirit Award at Cinema Eye Award for Best Documentary. Alex is a regular contributor to the New York Times Magazine. His work has appeared in the New Yorker, Granta, the Washington Post, and Chicago Tribune on PBS and public radios, This American Life. Um, a former staff writer at the Wall Street Journal, his journalism honors include a Peabody, Peabody Award, a Kennedy Journalism Award, a George Polk Award, and he's the recipient of seven honorary degrees. Um, his play, An Unobstructed View, premiered in Chicago in 2005, and he's a writer in residency at Northwestern. Please welcome Alex Kowalski. Shout out to my master students. Could you please raise your hand? Okay. So we expect some great questions from you later. Uh, so I have to say, you know, slightly misty-eyed, it is truly an honor to be on stage with you. I have read and reread your books at times in the middle of the night when I thought, why in the heck am I doing this kind of work endlessly and I need some inspiration. So it was with deep gratitude that I welcome you. We have so much to learn from you in oral history, and um, I think there's a great relationship between oral history and journalism that has yet to be explored. Um, I'm able to teach a little in the journalism school, and I have to say that these journalists are just amazing people who go out and find tough stories and come back and report on them in you know, 10 to 30 to 40 hours with such amazing ability. Um, 
so one of the things we want to talk about tonight is how there are over areas of overlap, especially in the realm of narrative, and I want to hear from you how you define narrative journalism. Uh, and there are also areas of difference, areas of difference that are productive, I think, and means that we have a lot to learn from each other. So I'd like for you to talk for a few minutes about that. I would say that the general themes of tonight, as Maria said, are that we are looking, both of us, in different ways at the kind of breakdown of justice in our society and possible ways in which, through narrative, we can address what those breakdowns are and what rehabilitation means. Thanks. Well, can people give me a bell? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me here. I'm thrilled to be here. I, I'm, um, uh, I'm a huge fan of oral history, and I'll talk about it in a minute in the context of my own work. Um, so, you know, people ask me what I do for a living, and I tell them I'm an author, I'm a journalist, uh, uh, I'm a filmmaker, but really the truth of the matter is I'm a storyteller. It's what I love to do, and it's what I think really my work is all about, is about telling stories. And I think it's, you know, stories are essential to who we are. They're essential to understanding ourselves. They're essential to understanding the world around us. And I think stories, you know, when done well, they do two things. You know, one is that they affirm our experiences, you know, they give credence to our personal and collective histories. Um, and we've all been there where we've seen a movie read a book and think to ourselves, that's my story in there. That's my life. Um, and of course, the other thing that stories do is they bring us places we otherwise wouldn't venture and introduce us to people we otherwise wouldn't have reason to be. And I think stories are really essential in these incredibly divisive and ideological times. Um, you know, I, I feel like so much of what we hear out there are people trying to tell us how to think. Uh, and what stories do um, at their best is they really allow us to kind of take that journey on our own and to find our own way. And even, you know, with my first book, There Are No Children Here, which is a book about a couple of boys growing up in the projects, which I wrote out of anger and out of shame. Um, uh, there are people who read that book and come away with very different ideas about what needs to be done. And for me, that's the power of story, is that they engage people. They spur a conversation. Um, and they don't tell, they're not trying to tell people how to think, they're not pandering to people. Um, and so I'm absolutely committed to this notion. And, um, and one of the things that for me is essential is the kind of centripetal force of any kind of storytelling is this notion of empathy. And, um, and I teach a couple of nonfiction narrative writing classes at Northwestern every winter. Um, and I'm just there in my last class. And one of the things that I kind of beat over the head with my students is that one of the things that's really important in storytelling as a, as a storyteller is to get out of the way of your story. Um, yeah, it doesn't mean not to use first person, but that really where we want to be is with the subjects, the protagonists of your story. And it's one of the beauties for me of oral history. Is the writer, the author, the narrator is completely out of the way. Um, and uh, and in my most much of my work in my writing, you think of that as writing in the third person. You know, when you're writing it through the eyes of the subjects, and that's the world of the eyes. So you're looking at the world through the eyes of these individuals who are the subjects of these oral histories. And in fact, one of the things that I've done recently is incorporated in my class. Um, Books like The Larry Project, uh, Anna Devere Smith's Twilight, uh, Richard Kapuscinski's The Emperor, uh, or Kami's Underground, these books that really sort of try to get at a singular moment in time through the eyes of the individuals in that moment. Because these are examples for me, the best examples of narrators completely getting out of the way of story. Um, what, how, when you talk about empathy, and, and I'm wondering, um, you, you write a lot and you interview a lot of people who are not like you. How do you draw with it upon yourself to find that empathy, and especially when it concerns stories of violence? So, you know, given what I do, I mean, I'm always an outsider wherever I go. I'm an outsider of my race, class, gender, religion, politics, circumstance. Um, and so part of it is I'm accustomed to 
being an outsider, but I think a couple things, we talked briefly about this before, I think one of the things that's first of all really important when you go into places that are unfamiliar, maybe even exotic or foreign, um, is that you be true to yourself. Um, you do not try to pick up the mannerisms and the dialect and the, of the people you're talking to, but, but maintain your own sense of who you are. Um, the other thing is, you know, you're there, you're asking people to be incredibly open and honest and candid with you, and so I think it's really incumbent on you to be equally honest and open and candid with people. And sometimes that can be really difficult moments where you're confronting people with things that are discomforting, that are unsettling. Um, but I think it's, it's what your place is to go ask those really difficult and tough questions at times. Uh, but in the end, for me, it's, it's kind of <coughs> trying to imagine myself what it's like to be this person, to try to you know, put myself in their place, in their shoes. What are the things that I imagine that I would go through? And often it's not the same thing. And one of my, you know, where I first really began to think about this notion of empathy, I remember when I was, began to write the Arnold Children here. Um, and one of the things that really unsettled me during the course of that work reporting that book, among other things, because it was plenty of unsettled me, was that the mother of the two boys I wrote about, who I deeply admired, um, two or three days a week, she would often go down to the other end of the projects to gamble with all night. And I would find out, because I would get phone calls from the two boys in the morning, you don't have any clothes, you don't have anything to eat for breakfast, and so I kind of learned over time, I would, you know, carry, keep extra cereal in my apartment, and I, in fact, that's the point where I actually bought socks so that I could bring it down and search for the boys. Uh, you, you can imagine I kind of got angrier and angrier, and when I sat down to write, uh, I was at a writer's retreat, and I began to wonder myself, did I pick the wrong family, did I misjudge this family, what's going on with his mother, and I remember I went for a walk, I was single at the time. And I went for a walk with this poet um, from Boston, and I was telling her about all my angst, and I tend to have a lot of angst when I'm writing. Um, but this was particularly deep and profound, and it really began to have doubts about the book. And she began to lecture me. She was a mother of four kids. Um, she began to talk about all the difficulties um, uh, and burdens of, of being a mother, let alone a single parent, let alone a single parent in a place like the projects. Chicago. And she said to me, she said, you know, I can only imagine that if I were that mother, that for me it would be my refuge, it would be my one respite from all these forces bearing down. And she instructed me to, um, to go out and really ask with Joe, the mother, what this was about, her leaving her kids home two or three times a week. And in fact, she was actually on target. It was exactly what she said, as that, you know, the Joe went down there because it was her only way to get away from all that was bearing down on her. It was her only lesson. It didn't justify what she did, but what it did is it explained it. It helped us understand it. It helped me understand it. And it was my first real lesson in this notion of empathy. I mean, here I am, this white single man, trying to understand what it's like to be a single mother, an African American mother, and it's really easy to accomplish. You sort of touched on this, but I'm wondering, um, because you do so much work for public presentation, and I think that's one thing we as oral historians need to learn, um, you seem to have great empathy and loyalty to the people you interview. You must have some hard choices from time to time about who you're most loyal to, the public, the audience, or the person. Right, I mean, I think it's a constant tension for people who do what I do, which is this, uh, your loyalty to story or your loyalty to your subjects, to the protagonists. Um, and, uh, and it's a really tough one. I mean, you, inevitably, you know, the people that I spend time with, it can be anywhere from, you know, a couple of months to two or three years, you know, I, we become friends. It's, it's, you know, it's impossible not to. It's impossible not to build some kind of relationship. And sometimes it's a complicated relationship. Um, and I feel like in some ways what the kind of narrative that I do feels in some ways kind of like a collaboration. Now, I don't want to sound too disingenuous because I know that in the end, that I'm, it's my story, that I'm the one who shapes the story, and often it's going to be a story that is shaped differently than what the subjects imagine. Um, but again, this goes back to this notion of being really honest with people. I try to, as, as I'm going along, inevitably, stories take on different shapes and forms that I imagine. And so for me, it's 
do it in company on myself that I'm constantly sort of talking with the people whom I'm writing about and filming uh, about just that. The other thing that we did actually with the film with the eruptors is we actually showed a rough cut to the main subjects of the film. Um, we weren't handheld over editorial control, but it was really important for us is that we wanted, first of all, to make sure that everything was accurate, but also that there was nothing in the film that compromised that or maybe compromised people in the film that it was that it wasn't a place where we got something even in a very nuanced way, got it wrong. And in fact, in the end, there was a scene that we ended up taking out of the movie. Uh, that has been one of the subjects. Not because it felt like he compromised him, but he worried about one of the people in that scene. And even blocking out his face wouldn't have given him any anonymity <coughs> to the gangs in that community. And so we ended up taking that scene out uh, for the rest. I wonder, because I know everyone is eager to see it, if you could tell us the story of how you became interested. I've read about it, but tell everyone the story of how you became interested in the project of the Interrupters. So, yeah, I mean, ever since uh, there are no children here, I've really been grappling with the violence in our uh, uh, central cities. Um, you know, during the course of that book, the two boys that I profiled, they lost three friends all over the land. Since the book has come out, uh, four of the boys that I knew, we're not the main subjects, but uh, four of the boys that I knew, uh, pretty, one of the, if you remember the book, Snuggles, one of them was a toddler in the book, uh, has since been heard. Uh, two of the boys have uh, served time for a little bit. Uh, and so I've seen the incredibly deep and profound impact it's had on them, on their families, and friends. And I know the profound impact it's had on myself. But I really kind of, uh, at some point, kind of threw my hands up in kind of res resignation. I mean, this violent has been so stubborn and persistent in these communities. Um, and I've been trying to, over the years, figure out ways to write about it, but it can give us some sense of and um, um, I still play basketball once or twice a week. And after one of my games, there was a guy who was new there. And I asked him what he did. He told me he worked for this organization, Six Fire. In Chicago, the bumper stickers are just ubiquitous around the city, the Six Fire bumper stickers. And so I was kind of vaguely familiar with it. And I thought, yeah, here we go, one more gang intervention. We've been there, we've done that. And I kind of lectured him. And I felt bad, and the next week I said to apologize. And he said, what? Well, I'm not spend a little time. And I did. And I was really taken with this group. It's a group that was founded by an infectious disease doctor who spent 10 years in Africa battling the first uh, cholera and Somali refugee camps in the late in Uganda. He came back to the States in the mid-90s and then began to sort of see, he came to Chicago. Um, he was like anybody living in the city, you know, he was reading about the violence. He began to think about the violence as and what interested me about this prism through which he was looking is it kind of took the moral judgment out of the equation. But the thing that really drew me into this group is I began to attend these Wednesday meetings of uh, these men and women whose job title are violence and rockers. And they're men and women formerly at the street uh, who, uh, whose job it is to go out and try to interrupt the violence, try to mediate conflicts uh, before they interrupt something more. Uh, and around that table were people I knew by reputation. One of the gentlemen was a, the biggest drug dealer on the south side of Chicago and had a kind of cameo appearance in my uh, There Are No Children Here. Another was actually the gang leader uh, in the projects that I wrote about and was the main figure in my book. Uh, and these are all men and women who, for some reason or other, had these second acts in life. And I not only got interested in their work, I got interested in their own personal journeys and ended up doing a uh, cover story for the New York Times Magazine. And while I was working on that, I began talking with my longtime friend, Steve James, who uh, directed Hoop Dreams, uh, who just destroyed a film about uh, these two young men from the west side of Chicago who dreams about playing basketball, for basketball. And uh, Steve and I had been talking about doing a film together, a dramatic film, and I began talking to him about this, these interrupters, and we began wondering if we could get the kind of access that we whether there might not be a film here that would allow us to sort of honestly explore the violence and do us to take a look at sort of why, why the violence and, and what we possibly can do about it. Great. I think it'd be great to go on to the clips. Great. So I'm going to begin with a clip that actually occurs for Jamie's film. So let me just tell you quickly about the film. We, we spent 
14 months following three of the interrupters. Um, um, and maybe, how many of you have anybody here seen the film? Or is this something you, okay. So the film follows these three um, interrupters. Um, uh, one woman, Amina Matthews, who comes from street world. And her father was uh, Jeff Ford, kind of a modern day Al Capone, um, who's now serving virtually a, a master of life sentence in a, a federal prison in Colorado. Uh, Amina's in her 40s. Uh, she's a force of nature. Those of you who have seen the movie, just there's another individual, Kobe Williams, who spent 12 years in prison, uh, lost his father to the streets when he was 11, uh, now lives in the suburbs with his family, and he's just this really kind of affable teddy bear like guy. And then the third person is a gentleman, Eddie Bocanegra, um, who killed somebody when he was 17. Uh, was, he belonged to a Latino gang, and one of his uh, gang members was shot and paralyzed, and Eddie was just enraged. Uh, and he went out ultimately to seek revenge, and he ended up shooting a rival gang member and killing him. And Eddie served 14 years in prison. And Eddie's story, and I'm going to show you a clip from Eddie's story, and I'll explain why, why this is a clip. Eddie's story is really kind of an internal story, which is a really tough kind of narrative to tell. Uh, it's really a story about trying to find a way to forgive himself. Uh, he's a guy who knows that his life has become defined by this one moment. But he took somebody's life, um, maybe really the ultimate human act. And so Eddie is trying to find a way to live with him. And so much of his grappling is with himself. And so the scene I'm about to show every June 17th, when uh, the anniversary of the murder, uh, he is for him a day of atonement. And he, he fasts for that day, and he goes out and makes a point of helping a stranger. And so what we're about to see is a, 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 a short scene of any uh, as the day of atonement. Um, and what interests me, part of the reason I'm showing you this is because it's a, kind of for me the magic of film. It's actually a very internal scene. It's really any kind of reflecting on what's going on with him. But what you see is all very external. So, uh, so let's sit here. I thought, um, hopefully one day, going to my victim's family and really just expressing to them how deeply sorry I am. And whether or not they accept my apology, I don't think they will. I really just want to do this. It's just that right now, I don't think it's still right. The last time for today, we're going to the cemetery to visit the family of uh, Miguel, a kid who was shot and killed a few weeks ago. Hello, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? You all right? I spoke to Vanessa, his sister, about some of the issues that are going in her home right now. Now, I, I never got to meet him, you know, to be honest, so I don't even know. <coughs> Actually, we brought a flower food that I wanted to pop, so. <coughs> Miguel got shot in the head. Vanessa was actually there when this happened. He pretty much died in her arms. I think that Vanessa does feel that what happened to her brother was her fault. But she can't blame herself because somebody else was ignorant, had a gun, and shot her brother. Yeah. 
for uh, a few months. I uh, filmed a lot with him, with his family. It became clear after a while that he felt really uncomfortable going out on the streets with us. And so we ended up having a sort of uh, uh, And I think in the end, we were better off. I mean, I think three subjects is about, it's a lot. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know how many of you have read <coughs> Hiroshima, uh, John Hurst's book on Hiroshima. Oh, God, got, if you haven't got to read it, but, <clears throat> it's a book in which there are five main subjects in that book. He does a really remarkable job sort of keeping track for us, the reader, of each of these <coughs> subjects. Two of them even show the same name. Um, and I think it's really hard if you've got more than two or three subjects to, uh, for your reader, or in this case, your audience, to really keep track and follow. Any other basic questions before we proceed to the next book? So the question is about whether our presence changed anything. And of course, you know, I'm always asking myself that. And I'm accustomed to going out by myself with a notebook and pen. And here we are, we've got, you know, we've got Steve doing camera work, we've got a sound person, we've got myself, we've got some people out there, you know, all this gear. And I'm thinking, my God, it's just going to happen people not sort of <coughs> begin to act play to the camera. I'll tell you what really, um, and it's interesting, so like when we would go out with COVID initially, we go out with Kobe, and, and, and in those first few weeks, it was, and, and you kind of felt like you were going out with an amateur television correspondent, because Kobe would, we'd have a camera going with Kobe down the street, Kobe would sort of stop and meet somebody on the street that he knew, and go, so what do you think about the violence? And, uh, and then he turned us and goes, is that something you want me to ask other questions? And, and so that would Kobe to sort of, you know, sort of, you know, go about his work. And what really would work for us in this film is once Eddie, Amina, and Kobe were comfortable with us, once they trusted us, when we went out in the community, everybody followed the lead. And it was actually kind of remarkable to me in some ways how little uh, our presence mattered in the end, if given this kind of tacit approval we had from the three of that. I mean, Kobe would introduce us as his film crew. That's how we would And um, and you can see in this moment here, for example, I mean, you know, and I, I think part of what I've learned over the years, you know, what the bottom line is people want to put the best face on themselves, right? I mean, that's clear. Um, but I also think that it's, you know, acting, being somebody who you're not, is really hard. It's a lot of work. And you might be able to pull it off for a day or two, but at some point, your guard drops and you are who you are. You know, unless you're a con artist, and con artists have to work for what they do. Um, and I think that was the case here. People were so in the moment um, that they would have taken so it was too much effort to be somebody who they were. But it's a really good question because it's something I wrestle with all the time, whether I'm doing film, radio, print, um, or always that whole thing. You know, so it's interesting. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, we had a kind of understanding with the interrupters. We asked them to call us all hours of the night. So they would. I mean, we were getting phone calls all the time. And, you know, I remember one time my wife kind of rolled her eyes and said, I just want to be like, you're not a doctor. But um, so we would get calls all hours of the night. We had an understanding that we got out there and we kind of recapitalized their situation or it was dangerous or people didn't want to be filmed that we would walk away. And so there were instances that we walked away from. Um, again, you know, one of the scenes, and I guess I hadn't planned to show it, but I could, is this scene with Flame. Um, we, we went out there, Kobe gets a phone call from a guy who had been in prison with. And, um, uh, and he says to Kobe, clearly part of him doesn't want to do what he's doing. He says, Kobe, I need to talk to you. I'm just enraged. By the time Kobe says I got a documentary film crew, Flame Road not really listening, he's coming with me. And when we get there, Flame Road at this point is down with about half a point about a pint of vodka. And, and so he's, he's inebriated, he's ready to go off. And I remember he comes down the stairs, he comes out in a rage, and then looks over at the three of us and goes, I'm going to 
the fuck are you guys again? <laughs> and Kobe says to him, you know, they're with us, you kind of expect to And then Flynn goes right back in the moment. And I don't think our presence had any difference. They had any difference in that. In that uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, I think, to be honest, we walked away from that moment thinking that we weren't clear. It wasn't clear to us that Flynn wasn't going to go out and try to find it. Sure. Um, you know, I hesitate to show the flame roll clip because it's out of context. It's a tough one. I want to show another clip actually that actually didn't make it into the final film. Um, and I'll explain, let me set it up and explain to you why I want to show this. Because it's really sort of about the clip that's uh, talking about technique. Um, this, there were two interrupters. There was a, a young guy, uh, his, I think must be maybe 30. Who became an interrupter during that Wednesday table? And he's sitting at that table on his first day, and he looks across the table and he sees a guy, U.S. Ford is his name. Uh, he used to be a head of a, a gang in the south side of Chicago. And Lloyd's father had been killed, I want to say 12, 13 years ago. And there had always been rumored that U.S. Ford was behind the killing of his father. And Lloyd's anger over the days and weeks just begins to mount. And at some point, they decided they've got to get Lloyd and Tisha the doors. Uh, uh, they need to bring Lloyd and U.S. Floyd together because they're worried that Lloyd, who his father was killed, is going to go off. And so the scene you're about to see is where Lloyd confronts U.S. Floyd about having some involvement in his father's. <laughs> are two individuals, Tio Hardiman, who is the director of the Interrupters, and Gary Slutkin, the white guy, who is the founder of Ceasefire. And what this scene allows us to do, it didn't end up in the final cut, uh, but it's an interesting thing to think about, because you have Tio and Gary reflecting on what's going on in the moment. And these are interviews that are obviously done at a later time. Uh, and so the, the scene itself is, incredible, I think, incredibly riveting, but it's also incredibly instructive. So, Bouncing interrupters to understand that whatever you did when you were running the streets, it follows you. This is a complete witness of another big time man trying to bring closure to what may have happened to his father. Lloyd Johnson was told since the age of 10 years old that Ulysses Floyd had had his father murdered. Ulysses Floyd was a very ruthless individual. Take me as 20 years ago, he would have never agreed to sit down with her. In the 70s and the 80s, I had thousands of guys on top of me. I ran with Larry Moon, I ran with Jeff Ford. I'm known in 50 states outside of Illinois. When Lloyd first ran to me, Mrs. Ford to Inglewood, he wanted to call some of his family members at his department to hurt on Mrs. Ford. And he stopped him. Your dad is not a chief. He was just a soldier. You want to keep it real? He never hung around me. I ain't seen your dad since about 82. Give me something. Tell me what you're telling what you know. He did something to some high-ranking members of the organization. He ran off. And he never came back to 95th Street. He never came back, so. He had to come back because I was 27. I wasn't on 95th. You know, I've been back to the thing. So, you know, I mean, I ain't, you know, from the same thing, just listen to a bunch of bullshit. You know what I'm saying? It don't add up at all. I mean, you know, that's what you say. He may have been up there while I was incarcerated. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But I was locked up. I was locked up, so I don't know. All I know is he drank. He could have been 87, 89, 99. I don't know. I said he was 10 years old. I don't know if it's true. Uh, you know, I don't know if I was a chicken. I was going to be a tennis trainer. Yeah. Yeah. So do my name come up? Yeah, yeah. You know, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to be sarcastic, right? Don't ask me to my name. No, he wasn't. No, he's trying to be sarcastic, and I ain't trying to. You know, don't, don't come. I'm saying, don't come back to money, man. Asking, you know, send your ass questions. If your name was in the paper, man, I wouldn't even brought you up to the table, man. But I'm telling you straight up, I would have came to you outright. Ten years ago at 17, when I was in my man. 
Four states. I ain't you get on my stand. I'm not going to ask you to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm being honest and sincere. Anger could be called a false emotion. Certainly we feel it, but it's, it's never a primary emotion. What, what occurs first is fear or sadness. Anger then trumps it. People told me, I just say I read it. I just say I read it. You have to get the emotion out of it. But you come in, you know, with this defense mode, like I'm outright a cue. I just say I believe. I said your name kept coming up. It's all a lot of trickery. No matter if I stay a thousand lives in the street, regardless of what I try to do, change my life or whatever, people don't stay and associate me with things that happened in the past. And that's all I can tell you. Lloyd shared with me that he was uh, satisfied with me because he wasn't expecting to listen to him. I said, he come straight out and said, look, I killed your father. I had something to do with it, but he got what he needed. Lloyd may have felt better that he was able to confront U.S. He can go back to his family members and say that he did that. It's highly relevant how he feels, but it's most important that he not make a mistake. You know, one of my favorite lines, the line of preparation. <laughs> <laughs> I just think this, you know, this scene, it reminded me too that one of the things that always just comforted me a little bit about this scene, you know, that early on when U.S. always says, I know in the 50 states, plus Illinois, it's a funny line. But it's a, it's a funny line at his expense, which always kind of makes me a little anxious um, as a storyteller. You don't want people necessarily laughing at the people who spend time on but what did she again get about this moment is it felt, you know, it was, uh, again, you've got Gary and Tio talking about what they do, and which could be incredibly boring, but in the context of what we've seen, uh, you really not only get it, um, it really engages you, whether you agree or disagree with what they have to say. Well, I've read the article and watched the movie, and I'm in journalism school here with a few of us in making documentaries, and one thing we're discussing is how you find a point of view, not necessarily to advocate for one side or the other, but to just have a point of view, and it's a very nuanced situation that you were dealing with, and you manage to handle all those nuances of them as people who are successful in the community, but not always, and how the stats don't necessarily back up the work, but some stuff does. It's just you know a nuanced, tricky situation. So going in, what was your point of view? What did you think it was going to be? And then how did that change throughout the process? Well, I will tell you one of the things that we really grappled with in this film. Um, it's not the change, but it's what we knew from the outset, but it was really, we really wrestled with it. We, my, my magazine piece, as you know, was kind of really about ceasefire, right? About sort of the underpinning, the philosophical underpinnings of that group, but it was about the interrupters. We didn't want to make a film about ceasefire. Um, that was very clear to us. We really wanted to make a film about the violence, so that using the interrupters as kind of our, our eyes and ears into these neighborhoods, kind of our gods, our narratives in some way. And yet, of course, you can't spend time with that without sort of understanding what ceasefire is. And that was a kind of, and I'm not sure we completely pulled it off, because it's interesting when we go to screenings, sometimes all people want to talk about is about ceasefire, and then other times all people want to talk about is violence and all the other issues that the film raises. So, so for us, I think that was a kind of fine, tricky line to walk um, as we were filming. And when you talk about point of view, I know this isn't quite what we meant, but when I think about point of view, for us, the point of view is this, of this film is a mean and a it's their stories, which is part of the reason why this scene didn't make it into the final cut. It's because it's not about either of our three main protagonists, and it really takes us a feel. Uh, and in fact, there really is, in this scene, there really is no, it's nobody's, we're not there with Lloyd, we're not there with U.S. Floyd, we're not there with Tito, we're not there with Jerry, we're not really there with anybody. And most of the film, we're really there with one of the other authors, and we're kind of looking at it all through their perspective. Thank <laughs> you. 
working on this film. I have done some, I've done some TV documentaries like before. And one of the things that drives me crazy about TV about a lot of documentary work is because it's a very cumbersome process and expensive, there's a lot of pre-interviewing that takes place. So they will call out and they'll interview somebody. And so you kind of know what you're going to get. And when you sit down with them, it really doesn't feel very fresh and spontaneous. And so we didn't do any of that for this film. And in fact, in the end, we sat down once we were done with the bulk of the film, we sat down with each of the interrupters who went to do a marathon session. We went on for six, seven hours, and we were both for lunch um, because we accumulated all these questions um, through the shooting. But in the end, I'd say anywhere between six to eight times for the region. And it's important, you know, whenever I'm working on a story, we are sitting down with people and interviewing them for the first it's often in different locations, places, presumably, where they feel comfortable. Sometimes you're interviewing them with others, uh, so there's just some dynamic of work. So even in this, we interviewed Kobe with his wife, we interviewed him with her husband. You know, we tried to look for moments where they could sort of uh, bounce off of that. I was wondering, after the film, did you have any events on the board and ceasefire? So, you know, ceasefire has got an enormous amount of press because of the film. And so, uh, there's no question that they've gotten interest. But they've already been replicated in other cities. And they've gotten interest from other cities uh, uh, because of the film. Uh, how's it affecting Inglewood? I don't know that it's directly affected it. We've shown the film in Inglewood, and it's been a really, you know, for us, one of the things that's real important for us is this film not only be seen by people who wouldn't and aren't from those neighborhoods but wouldn't spend time there, but also that it's seen by people from Inglewood, communities like it around the country. And so now, but the film's kind of had its theatrical run and its TV uh, broadcast that we're really uh, uh, committed to trying to get this film out into communities, you know, whether it's schools or churches and communities or even to the prisons. What was your role in the editing process? Because you must have had tons of hours of footage. Right, we had over, we had close to 350 hours of to give you an idea, we filmed for 14 months. We filmed more footage than they did with Hoop over the course of four years. Uh, and so Steve and I worked very closely, uh, uh, you know, on trying to shape the structure of this film. I would be in the editing room two or three days a week uh, going through scenes. I'll tell you that one of the things for me that was frustrating um, as a writer, and I, maybe it's either the way I'm just kind of naturally wired or it's the way I become wired. But every time, when I'm working on a book or a magazine piece, I can hold it all in my head. I mean, I can work through scenes and move them about and sit down. It's all it's all up there. It wasn't that way with the film. And I'd go into the editing room, and I constantly would have to be reminded when we sat down to look at a scene, what preceded it, what followed it. Uh, and it really was frustrating for me at some level. And again, I don't know whether it's the way I'm actually wired, it's just the way I can come to look at things. So, I mean, I'm going to show one more clip, if you'd like. Um, uh, and I think what I'll do is show a scene in which there's no narration, in which it's a scene in which it is unencumbered. Uh, do we have time for one more clip? Yeah. So, which is unencumbered by uh, any voiceover. Um, and just a little context. So um, <clears throat> Kobe had uh, uh, kind of taken under his wings young uh, this kid, Little Mikey, who we knew from the streets. Uh, little Mikey, at the age of 15, uh, robbed a barbershop with two other guys. Um, and uh, he was tried as an adult and was sent off to prison for close to three years. And when Kobe went to pick Little Mikey up from the prison, one of the first things Little Mikey told Kobe is that he wanted to go and apologize to the people in the barbershop. And so what you're about to see is the scene in which Kobe is taken Barbershop. And I'll talk afterwards a little bit about how this scene almost didn't happen. Uh, so this is actually
Jab, Sancho, ele tem que ter ele fica raro, ele fica meio jave, né? Mas ele não tem problema. Eu estou trabalhando com o Mikey por um tempo, mesmo que ele está em prisão, ele não está estressando, ele não está apologizando com as pessoas que nos roubaram no barbershop. Eu não sei o que é, mas nós temos que ir para o campo. Nós não sabemos como isso vai se tornar. Nós vamos conversar com eles. Se eles não aceitam ou não, eles ainda, como eu sei que eu fiz um erro, e eu estou perguntando se vocês nos perguntam. Nervous going here. I think I'm gonna stop feeling it when I get in the shop. Hey, Algon. I understand that in August 24, 2007, that me and two other fellas came in here and stuck the place up. I know I'm deeply, I'm deeply sorry. I know I made a mistake. I was 15 and I was following the crowd, but now I'm older. I'm more mature than I was, and I wanted to let y'all know that I was sorry for what I did on my behalf. I don't know how these two other brothers feel about themselves, but I know I made a complete 360 month uh, during my uh, almost three years being incarcerated. Well, with me, my mistake was not really that big. Uh, 
you asked him to think of all that he did, and then he agreed to the rest. So, I think what's also remarkable about this moment, um, we didn't know what to expect. Um, so just to give you a sense, so here we are, you know, you've asked about sort of our impact on the moment on the scene. So here we are, a company were like, well, that guy who you see talking is actually an off-duty police officer. They were so nervous about having no mic come back. I mean, there's no notion of forgiveness kind of launched in the film. Uh, but uh, this is just one of these moments that I'm sure it's all that we can just feel pretty bad and fortunate. Uh, how, have you thought about how this film and what's in it might relate to other situations, like, for example, the truth commission in South Africa? No, we have. I mean, we're sort of, we've, uh, I was with the film in, uh, in Rio, um, where actually the film is going to be shown in uh, Tel Aviv for a couple of months. Um, and uh, no, I think that a lot of the themes, and this is the beauty of the story, is that are really universal, as you suggest. Uh, I mean, you know, places like Syria and anywhere in the world, it's obviously it's complicated. But I think there are things that people will see here. I mean, this, just, the, just this notion of forgiveness and what it means and how we, what it means to forgive somebody. I think those are really important things that we all think about. Um, so, can you talk about um, your prescript a bit of your idea of the shooting scenes you wanted to have on the movie and the ones that um, you, how you went to get those uh, scenes you wanted, and also the ones that kind of appeared, like this one, and how you were able to kind of capture them. And, uh. Well, let me tell you that we really, we went in, uh, and I think Steve and I share a similar sensibility about this. I mean, let me just back up and just tell you, one of the reasons I love my work, uh, among others, is that it feels like this constant state of discovery and astonishment. And the last thing I want is to begin a project where I feel like I can somehow imagine everything that's going to take place. Um, we knew, I mean, the only thing that we knew going into this film is we needed a handful of interruptions. We didn't need a lot. We weren't doing reality TV. Um, we just we knew that we needed to get out of the street. Beyond that, we were completely in. In fact, I remember, like, for example, this scene, the scene that precedes this, um, with little Mikey, and the little Mikey just gets out of prison, and Kobe takes him back to meet his brother and sisters. And I remember when Kobe said to us, you know, I am going to pick up this young guy who's getting out of prison. Do you guys want to come join me? And I remember Steve and I thinking, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's really something that really interests us. And, I mean, the good thing about having two of us is always one of us would always say, well, you know, maybe you ought to just go. You never know. And so, um, and fortunately we did, because Mikey's story is an incredible story in this film. So, uh, you know, there really wasn't anything that any particular scene that we wanted, except that we knew we needed two or three interruptions, and we got those. Uh, and we didn't know what they were going to be. But beyond that, everything was just a, a surprise. And you also go and do big interviews, like you were talking about. Um, how did you decide? to interweave those interviews with certain part of the story? Well, so it's a really good question. So we did these extensive interviews, and we had you know, 10 scores of pages of transcripts. Um, so what we did, the way we worked, is we went, we had all this footage. We were editing scenes as we were going along. But we were also going through the transcripts and looking at the parts of the transcripts that we felt were most profound, most provocative most relevant to what we were shooting. Um, and, uh, and so we then began to sort of think about places or scenes that it might fit. So for example, with Eddie, you know, we, this notion of trying to forgive himself, we were looking for places. And there are a couple of places in the film, we saw one of them, where he kind of reflects on what he did and sort of how, uh, and how he's kind of grappling with it. Um, but usually, you know, you were looking for moments where the reflections somehow are echoed in what you're seeing. Uh, <coughs> I mean, the thing about film is, you know, talking heads are open so far, and uh, film is all about 
seen. But the truth of the matter is, and I tell my writing students this, is the best of now <coughs> writing is really cinematic, is really moving from scene to scene to scene. Uh, it's really what the film is, you know, that it's working well. So, <coughs> um, I was curious about your upcoming projects. It seems that every project, every experience you've had with this is the next project. And I was curious about how do you put the rest, the relationships and friendships that you create to move on to the next one? Well, I, I mean, again, one of the things, one of the perks of the what I do is I, you know, you, you don't develop relationships with everybody that you end up writing about or making films about, but they become part of your life. So any of you call me or So I'm not moving on from that. I mean, those friendships are there, they're intact, and, you know, I feel my life is much richer for it. Um, it is hard always to move to the next project to sort of put this aside. Um, so I'm, right after I finished the film, I actually turned to a screenplay that I had sort of put on hold. So I spent the fall finishing that up uh, uh, based on the old New Yorker story of mine. And, uh, and now I'm trying to let my way to my next film. I'm chopping the video back to my writing, so that's where I'm personally at. And Steve and I will probably do something together again. I don't think we'll do another documentary, but probably what we'd like to do is do a, a dramatic film together where I would write the script and do it to write. Yes. So from the journalism school in the documentary program, and uh, I was wondering how you went about getting releases, especially during like the interruptions and scenes where you filmed maybe before you asked for permission. So let me, for those of you not familiar, so one of the things about the documentary world, um, which is mystifying to me, you need to get releases uh, for anybody who has a speaking role. 
Um, which for, and the reason is mystifying for me. When I go out and I'm working on a magazine piece or a book, and all I've got is my notepad and pen, I don't have to get releases. And here we are, we've got a camera, we've got uh, sound equipment, and people are so evident what we're doing, and yet we've got to get this kind of legal acknowledgement that, uh, that I know I've been filmed. So we did two things. One is that sometimes we go back at a later date, but we also worked it out with Frontline, which was one of our main uh, partners in the film, that we could get uh, audio releases. So we sometimes we just get a release on camera. We'd say, like Flamo, in fact, we eventually got a, a sign release from him, but in, in that moment, we just Flamo, we just wanted to know we're doing this documentary about Kobe and some of the other interrupters, we just wanted to make sure that you're aware of it. And Flamo goes, yeah, I, I hear you, I know what you're doing, okay. And that was enough. But yeah, we had to get releases from everybody in this because there were a lot of releases. We tried to make a point of doing it right when we were filming. Right we were That's a pain, if you guys know. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not fun to do that. So the crew was very small. We should be. I was determined to keep it small, and so I suggested going on to Steve that he shoot, which he ordinarily doesn't. So it was myself, Steve was shot, and then we had Zach Piper, who was our co-producer and sound person. And sometimes I would do sound. I actually well, was taught sound. I don't, I'm really not very good when it comes to technical stuff. In fact, the one scene in the movie where you can see the transmitter and the wire is the, the scene that I did with the sound. <laughs> Life stories of these people, not just <coughs> the event story. 
he became a Muslim. He, he worked in London. He was raised in London. And he wanted to become faithful. And so he tried to find a way to do that and still have work because he would have to pray four times a day. And this is very much in my mind having come back from Turkey several different places where I make at 4.30 a.m. to the prayers, which are very important and very loud and very all-encompassing. And um, so he couldn't find, uh, he, he thought he'd gotten a job as a street worker, sweeper, which he was able to sweep and still be able to stop. And the head of the company said, no, you can't pause at any point to pray. So he went to Afghanistan. And in his, in his story, he's picked up by a U.S. bounty hunter. And that's his, his story. And so now we're going to see a clip where he talks about being picked up in Kandavar. And um, he was unable, he put together this small deal. We have about 120 hours, mostly with lawyers and judges and people who give us the legal context. And now we're moving into the narratives of the, of the people who were detained or in prison and their family, their family narratives. And so we were able to make his thinking about visualizing history, able to make his testimony but more real by including the artwork of a young artist who sat and listened to his testimony in the courts and drew what he said. And then um, I ate that, and then we were taken out to the to the um, uh, runway. And then we landed at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Um, I didn't know it was Guantanamo Bay. Um, and people will be taken out. Well, obviously, this is by sound. There's, there's, there's no image of these enemies. This is by sound. And then um, the soldiers will stand on either side of you, and it's your turn to go down the ramp. And then they're saying things like, you know, they're, they're really effing. The Marines are really effing them up, and you can hear the shackles moving faster than they should do, which means that they're cutting at the, at the, at the ankles. Um, you can hear people screaming, um, both uh, you know, um, saying F this and F that, F this, F that, and the uh, detainees screaming as well. Um, you can just hear uh, all you do by hearing, and then obviously I'm, I'm kind of getting tense now because it's my turn next, I'm going to go down the ramp, and then I'm going to get uh, effed up. Um, so they put me in the hands of the Marines, and then they, they lift you up and check one side, lift you on another side, and you, you, you frog march from one, one set of hands to another, and then basically end up in um, the stress position. So they put us in the compound, and there's this famous Pentagon picture of um, they released of uh, us in stress positions. Uh, if that is the first picture, I'm, I'm one of them. And then I was sitting in that stress position, so there's the hot sun, there's a face mask, um, you know, to do surgical masks on your face. Um, the sweat is going to surgical masks, you can't breathe. Uh, there's the, the dog barking, there's someone barking, um, the soldier barking orders, and, uh, and the bad translation of Arabic. Um, you know,
know, just uh, just sitting there in this, in this distressed position. You have to hold a position. Your hands have to be in a certain place. The sun would go down, and I'm still there. And I'm just hearing all these saying these drop like flies, and then they get dragged away, and you can hear the chains. And I think I was the last one, and then basically they came. Um, before um, before they did that, they took my sandal off my foot, and then um, I don't know why they took the sandal off my foot, and then they, they took me out, and they uh, took me out into processing. And then they we get a shower um, in front of you, food, you of everyone, and they kill you, and you got like a few seconds, and then um, and you go back and they put you in the jumpsuits, and then um, there's the anal search again. Um, and then all I, all I remember is, because with the goggles you could see a little bit underneath, like you could see your feet uh, or you could see down. I just remember the light had changed, it was those floodlights that became very familiar. And I remember the clanking of the gates that um, were new sounds to me, but they, were, they become very familiar. And then I remember the, the, the grass, and then because of the floodlights they're a different colour. It, was, it, it wasn't green, it was just kind of a different green. And then I was put into my cage, and then they took off the goggles. And then my eyes took a while to readjust. I stood up and looked, and the first image I saw was an Afghan in orange, uh, in a cage similar to mine, praying, which I later learned was in the wrong direction. And then uh, I just, you know, I, I looked around, and that was it. And I was in a cage, and my concern was to pray. Um, I prayed as best as I could during that whole process, but. Um, I said, I'll never repeat, repeat the prayers again. And then I was praying in the same direction as the Afghan, so I was praying in the wrong direction as well, but I know so I can pray. And then that's it, I'm in camp um, expert. When I saw the images from one time, like that really had a nerve. Because See, this is really powerful stuff. I'm really excited about this one project. Um, and one of the things that excites me about it so just to quickly about this sort of notion of this unreliable narrative. So here you've got a guy who has been accused by our government of right, of terrorism, right? He was picked up and he goes into the town hall and listen to his uh, testimony about what happened there. I think for those of us who, uh, you know, pay close attention to what's going on in Guantanamo, it all feels, you know, very real, real and kind of validates uh, uh, much of what we know and heard. I think as journalists, if you guys would understand this, I think one of the challenges is so how do you take this testimony, right, this moment, and sort of make it reliable, reach out to people unlike ourselves who perhaps have sort of view him as a guy who's been accused of terrorism and just think maybe we just didn't have the, the goods and released him, and why would we believe him? And I think what's wonderful about this Guantanamo project is that is the contextual nature of it. Is that they're trying, they're going out and making all these people, so people will, you know, echo what this gentleman has talked about, which will validate uh, his story. And I think that's one of the challenges we have. It's why I so am so drawn to books like Anna Devere Smith's Twilight and The Larry Project and uh, The Emperor, because there are books that can kind of contextualize these singular moments and take all these different voices. Um, I mean, I was telling you, uh, Marshall, I had an experience a few years ago where I had an assignment from New York Times Magazine to write about a former Guantanamo detainee. Uh, what? Right. Right. And, uh, right. and, uh, um, and to write about his experience after Guantanamo. And this is an individual who was released to uh, Chad, where he um, uh, had not, he, he was his parents were chatting, but they were part of the diaspora of Saudi Arabia, so that he was raised in Saudi Arabia. Anyway, long story short, I, right before I was to leave, I began to have second thoughts about it, all about this question of reliable narrator. I was going to go spend time with each other. He'd been there for six months. He'd been at Mohammed for six months. And I realized I had nobody else to talk to. He didn't know anybody else in chat. I He was going to be the only guy, nobody who could sort of help validate what had taken place in those six months. And I thought as a storyteller, I had this real dilemma. Um, how, it's not that I can trust it, but how is it going to get readers to trust it? And I felt in the end that there wasn't a way to contextualize what had happened to them. And I think what I love about this project is it's going out and talking to all these different voices. And so it's going to be, the, the thing is the whole here is going to be so much greater than the talk of something. Well, as I, as I would tell my students, and they've heard me preach about this all year, one of the first things we do in our history laboratories is questioning the reliability, the construction of sources, and what reliability and 